Good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for coming out tonight to join us. My name is Drew Dameron, and I'm the library manager here at the club. And for tonight's Tech Talk, we are very happy to be hosting this amazing panel of speakers, authors, and translators from Monkey Magazine. We'll start tonight's event with a panel discussion and then open it up for questions from those attending in person and virtually. For those online, please use the Q&A function to submit your questions to me and I'll ask them on your behalf. After the Q&A, we'll have a book sale and signing to close out the event here at the table to the side. Those attending virtually will also be able to purchase books to be signed and can pick them up at the library. Please just let us know with the Q&A function and tell us your name and tech number to reserve a copy. Before we begin, I would like to introduce our panel moderator, Motoyuki Shibata. <laughs> Shibata-san is the founding editor of the Japanese literary journal Monkey and has taught American literature and literary translation at the University of Tokyo until retiring in 2014. Shibata is responsible for rendering American writers as diverse as Thomas Pynchon, Paul Auster, Richard Powers, and Edward Gorey into Japanese. And as a sign of his linguistic prowess, Shibata has a, was awarded the Japan Translation Cultural Prize for his 2010 translation of Pension's Mason and Dixon, a feat that will undoubtedly impress any reader who has encountered this literary leviathan in its original language. Thank you again, and please welcome our speakers tonight. Uh, good evening, thanks for coming. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the Monkey Magazine first for two minutes. Uh, Sorry, I'm quite uh, low tech. Hmm. Okay, uh, this is our magazine, Monkey. Uh, this first issue came out last year. Uh, this is the only uh, issue we have published so far, but uh, uh, we have a prehistory. From uh, 2011 to 17, uh, we ran another literary journal called Monkey Business. This is our sort of rebirth of that journal. And the uh, only thing we learned running a literary journal for seven years is that there is no business in literary business. So we took out business and we now simply called uh, ourselves Monkey. Where, uh, before we used to uh, call ourselves Monkey Business. Now we took out business. And uh, oh, this is uh, oh, sorry. This is another journal I run, uh, the, the uh, Japanese literary journal, also called Monkey. Um, they look identical, and the, uh, some of the articles overlap. You know, uh, we uh, publish same story in Japanese in one journal and uh, in English in another in the other journal. Uh, but uh, they are not really identical, but we, uh, they share the uh, same uh, spirit uh, of uh, what we hope to be a mixture of playfulness and seriousness. And uh, we don't try to be representative of a whole Japanese literary scene, but uh, we pride ourselves that we work with the uh, uh, best of the uh, uh, Japanese authors we have now, two of whom are uh, with, uh, with us here tonight. Uh, you can see some of the... Uh, uh, some of the names must be familiar to you, like uh, uh, like Haruki Murakami, Yoko Ogawa, and we also uh, publish uh, writers from North America and Great Britain. We hope there uh, occurs a kind of uh, cultural dialogue on the pages across the oceans, and we also uh, we are maybe we may be more proud of the uh, uh, translators we work with. Uh, we can uh, uh, say with great confidence that uh, we work with the very best uh, English from Japan, uh, sorry, Japanese to English translators of, uh, of our Japanese uh, literature. And uh, even though the texts are the most important thing in our journal, we uh, take visuals uh, quite seriously too. And uh, in the first issue, we have a uh, wonderful this picture story by uh, Satoshi Kitamura. And also this one is by uh, the Canadian picture book artist, uh, John Klassen. And uh, he uh, 
produced a great, uh, the uh, graphic narrative and the text was created by Yoko Ogawa. Um, the, uh, uh, some of the, uh, you can see some of the illustrations in a, a first issue. And uh, tonight we have two authors uh, with us and the, uh, uh, now they're going to talk. And the first one is, uh, th uh, this is a short essay by uh, Tomoka Shibasaki and her writing is, is very uh, subtle and evocative, especially uh, with the uh, great sense of place, not so much about the uh, uh, specific uh, present moment specificity, but rather as with, uh, uh, rather with the, uh, the sense of layers of time that hidden behind the present moment of a place. I hope I'm making sense. Uh, you you uh, be able to make much more sense by reading uh, her uh, books, and uh, one of books uh, one of her books is on sale tonight. Uh, one of uh, her, her representative books, Spring Garden. Okay. So uh, Tomoka Shibasaki san. どうも、皆さん、今日こんばんは。今日はどうもありがとうございます。柴崎智子です。よろしくお願いします。えっと、今日はあの私このモンキーに乗っているあの短いエッセイをあの朗読します。Good evening. Uh, my name is uh, Tomoka Shibasaki. I'm very happy to be here today. Thank you so much for coming. Today I'm going to give a reading of a short essay that's featured in the Monkey magazine. で、この絵は、あの、家族の話を書いています。あの、私が子供の頃の自分の家族の話です。で、この絵はもう10年、10年と少し前ぐらいに書いたんですけれども、その頃ちょうど自分の周りの友達が、あの、自分の家庭を持
かわいいっていう美しいお弁当っていうのがあの評判だったりするんですけれどもうちの家はそうではなかったという話です。So, in Monkey, my essay is accompanied by a very cute illustration of a bento box. And now the Japanese bento has become kind of well known in the world for being very beautiful and, and cute.、Um, but I can say that when I was growing up, my family、uh, did not, we did not have bento like this. であのまだこのエッセイを書いた頃はそのこういうお弁当じゃなかったうちの,あの家族っていうのはちょっと変わった家族なのかなと思っていたんですけど今10年経った今,今あの友人たちの家族なんかとせあの家に遊びに行ってご飯を食べてたりするとあ本当にみんなそれぞれなんだなって普通の家とかなんかあの。平均的な家族っていうのはないんだなっていうのを改めてあの思いますしこ,うこのエッセイを書いてよかったなと思っているので今日はあのこ,こ,ここであの朗読できてとっても嬉しいです。And when I wrote this essay 10 years ago, I, I wrote it thinking that my family、uh, was a bit strange, that I didn't grow up in an ordinary、um, family. But now, 10 years later,、um, I have a chance to go over to my friend's house and、uh, eat meals together with them and see how their family is like. And, and I realize how each family is so different.、Uh, and now I, I think that my family was not so strange as I thought. And I'm very happy that I wrote this essay and that I'm. Reading it today for you. ありがとうございます。Okay, thanks very much.、Uh, so, we are going to have a, a, a play a pre recorded video by her translator, Polly Burton,、uh, who is a wonderful translator. As I said, her、uh, prose is very、uh, evocative and subtle. Which would be very hard、uh, for translators, and the police translation、uh, captures very nicely the subtlety of、uh, Shiba Sakson's prose.、Uh, since she lives in、uh, Britain,、uh, she cannot、uh, participate real time、uh, tonight, but、uh, we created a pre recorded video of a police talk.、So. I think it feels different to translate each Japanese author. And、uh, what's、uh, different or special about translating Shiba Sakisan's work? Yeah, that's a really great question.、Um, Because you know, she's not the kind of writer who you know, grabs you from the very、uh, first line, she sort of you know, steals into your heart quietly. Absolutely. And,、uh, and I think, it's, I don't know, especially for me, like a lot of The other Japanese authors who I've worked with are quite,、um, in comparison to Shiba Saki Sans, work, I suppose, quite like high octane and quite、mm. often very witty.、Um, mm. And kind of every, every sentence is, is popping、um, mm. and, and very humorous. And, and that's the case with the, the other writer you translate for, Monkey,、uh, Aoko Matsuda. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, even you know, with, with Algo and with、um, Tsumura Kikuko as well, Kikuko. like, right, even if it's kind of deadpan, it's still quite, yeah, there's, there's a lot going on on kind of a humor level, I think, which is、mm -hmm. often what sucks you in initially and quite informal.、Um, and Shibasaki san's work is, feels very notably different to that. For me,、um, I mean, I guess the, the broad similarity, I mean, this is so broad that it almost becomes meaningless, but I feel like for all of them, Shibasaki san included, voice is, is huge, right? But, but like we said, Moto, like it's something that builds much more slowly and she wins your heart gradually. And, and that's what I really enjoyed when I was reading. We are sure. First, is that sort of I got swept up in it, and then before I knew it, I was absolutely in that world, you know,、mm. like, it, but it's, it's very soft. You kind of don't notice the, the hands coming around you. And, and I guess when I'm translating her,、um, that's something that I, I, I really need to think about and, and not try, 
you know, I think my, my tendency is sometimes to try and over polish the English and, and, and make, make it, make it grab you from the first sentence more. And I think kind of toning that back and consistently reminding myself to just stay with the Japanese voice has been, has been very important. Um, and I guess maybe especially, so I, I translated Spring Garden, um, which is a, a full length work um, by Shibasaki san And, you know, when I was working on that, I felt like something that was so crucial was, was rhythm. It's just really finding the rhythm of the sentences. Because I think after, after a while of reading and reading and reading the Japanese, I kind of came to the feeling that that was, that was a very key mechanism. You know, that was how the kind of the hands <laughs> came in and, right. and grabbed you. So that, yeah, that was, mm -hmm. that was something that I definitely contemplated. Oh. The question that I've been thinking about, I'm American, and, but my mom is British. And I... Um, I always feel that my understanding of Japan is informed a lot by my understanding of at home of British culture by having an, an English mother. Like I feel often if I were just American with, um, you know, both parents American, there's a lot of things that would make less sense to me, but with this layer of growing up with a, between English and British, but with this English, um, there's certain things that just seem so similar to me between England and Japan. For example, mm. um, you know, the, we could just use words, manners, appearance. And also I was just thinking as you were speaking about kind of mildness in speaking, you know, we, I always have a situation with my mother where she expresses things much more mildly and myself being very American, it's always very direct. And to her, it's still, after all these years, a bit, yes, it's an affront. And I just wondered if you had any thoughts around that sort of, are there parts of Japan that, in Japanese culture and literature that feel similar or co comfortable because of being British or? That's, I, I can't tell you how fascinating that is, really. <laughs> to hear you say that I mean these are things that I thought about a lot I think you know I always try and resist making these broad generalizations I suppose you know especially with something along the lines of like American culture is more direct than British culture because it feels like in order to say that or even really articulate it to myself I need to provide so many different caveats <laughs> that you know but at the same time I do I do see a lot in what you say and certainly for me like the, I find it very hard to phrase things directly <laughs> um, <laughs> and and I think you know I've heard people explaining the kind of the roundabout ways that some of some Japanese locutions, you know, that rather than saying no, you might to an invitation, you might say, oh, that's a little bit dot dot dot, or that's a little bit difficult. You know, and I and I've heard these explained in the kind of when I first arrived in Japan, like, oh my gosh, isn't that wondrous? And to me, I, I kind of thought, well, no, like we do that all the time. <laughs> <laughs> you know that's that I feel very much at home with that and I've seen these silly memes on the internet with you know kind of translating British English into US English and the, yeah the, the indirect so I, I suppose that's a very long and indirect way of saying I, I do very much agree with what you're saying um yeah okay uh the uh, second question I was uh, Elizabeth Cole, who uh, initially came up with the idea of uh, doing this event. So I'd like to uh, thank you, Elizabeth. And uh, the uh, great interpreter we have is Hitomi Yoshio, uh, who has been uh, part of our team from the beginning. Yoshio-san, please. 
Okay, uh, before we ask uh, Shibasaki-san to do her reading, uh, I'd like to introduce uh, Hideo Furukawa. Elizabeth uh, mentioned uh, mildness uh, as a, a characteristic uh, common um, uh, between Great Britain and Japan and not in the US. Uh, there is not, uh, but there is nothing mild about Furukawa-san. <laughs> And uh, before 2011, I would have uh, described his work as uh, apocalyptic. But uh, since 2011, uh, we have uh, we grown more cautious and careful about playing with the idea of the sense uh, uh, of the end of the world. And uh, since he came from uh, uh, Fukushima, uh, since 2011, he is more seen as a Fukushima writer, which I also uh, hesitate to call because the word Fukushima so tends to, you know, over-determine everything. You know, once you get the, the label, you know, people get the uh, uh, certain uh, fixed ideas and uh, uh, tend to use you as a writer, as a sort of source of information about this place called uh, Fukushima. Um, so <laughs> I think it's best to let him talk. Oh, thank, you. On this. Thank, you. thank you for being here for us, despite these terrible circumstances. I mean, under the COVID-19. I call it a plague or a disaster. And this disaster has been giving me, pushing me a feeling of deja vu. Deja vu about another disaster, of course, the Great East Japan earthquake. You know, it occurred in 2011. Shibata-san already told you all that uh, I was born and raised in Fukushima Prefecture. I'm sure that almost all of you know that great earthquake caused the tsunami, and the tsunami caused meltdowns at three nuclear reactors in Fukushima, to be exact. In Fukushima Daiichi nuclear power plant, we Fukushima people call it Ichi-F. It means one F in English. F stands for Fukushima. This March, I published a book titled Zero F. Zero F. This March in 2021 means just 10 years after the Great East Japan earthquake. The book Zero F is my first non-fiction. I interviewed some, three th some 30 people living in Fukushima now. I walked over 360 kilometers on the quick hit areas on foot, on my own feet. You can easily imagine it was a strong, powerful experience doing those things. I have been fearing that writing this book, Zero F, transformed me into a different writer, author, or a different being. Now I can assert, I can assert non-fictions are strong and this generalization forcing me to question myself. How I can write just fictions after having published this non-fiction? But what is the just fiction? Consisted of anti-truth, right? We know truth. I probably need to add the word maybe. We maybe know it, but what is untruth? Imagine a book. The book consists of anti-truth only, full of untruth entirely. It's hard for me to imagine it. For instance, aliens and UFOs are unreal, just untruth. Should I add maybe? Nevertheless, once I say aliens here and now, you can see the typical creatures in your mind. 
in our brains, we will create anti-unreal beings, anti-unreal beings. And we are able to share them since they are so vivid, so vivid. Don't you call it real? I mean, truth. Considering these kinds of questions feels like a torture to me. I'm quite sure that tortures are not an adequate incubator for novels, for the whole literature. Although in this real our world, we have always been sharing truth and untruth as well, because they are provided from powers or something, and the world is always made of non-fictional matters, elements, and fictional matters, including, including aliens. So, I'm now obsessed with some strange thought. Are uh, incubators for nonfiction and for just fictional novels the same? I'm starting to change my mind. I have to look for purely unreal things based on reality because realities contain aliens. I don't know how I conclude this talk, but I could say I'm trying to get something pure and truth for my forthcoming novels based on truthfulness. And maybe I've already been trying up until now, and I will try. Thank you. Well, the last speaker uh, we have tonight is uh, -san, one of Furukawa-san's translators, Jordan Smith. And uh, Shibasaki-san uh, gives translators hard time, but in, in, in many different ways, Furukawa-san also gives translators hard time. But uh, Jordan uh, has done full justice to uh, one of the uh, uh, Furukawa-san stories. Um, uh, Jordan. Thank you so much. Um, well, I would, I would like to start by just saying thank you. Um, Shibata Sensei is such a, a, a humble person. You might overlook what he's done for the relationship between Japanese and English language literatures, and it's it's enormous. Um, it's not only one wide, strong bridge that he's built over his decades of a glorious career, but it's many dozens of strong, wide bridges. And he gives me incredible um, feedback on these comments. I want to say thank you uh, to you for, for your meticulous work and for being a great mentor as a translator. Um, I have with me a, a, a copy I printed out and I, I brought uh, today with his comments um, on the side. And I think probably you won't be able to see this, but for those of you that know what a Microsoft Word document looks like with lots of comments on it, you can see it's blue, 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 blue all the way down. And these are uh, these are not just comments like fix this word, fix that word. It's full, long paragraphs quoting, uh, you know, Furukawa's original Japanese to explain why he thinks one particular uh, shift or a subtle word change might might uh, convert the entire meaning of the story. Uh, this is an absolute delight as a literature nerd uh, to get to participate in such a project. Um, Furukawa's work um, has impressed me for a long time. He's had uh, really wonderful translators also. And um, so for those of you that are English readers, I would encourage you to, um, to look at the full range of works that are, that are out. There are three wonderful translators, um, David Boyd, Doug Slaymaker, and Michael Emmerich, who have all worked on uh, his stuff. And so there's a, uh, some very big shoes um, to fill in working on uh, his stuff. The... Um, is it okay if I just briefly introduce the work that we're talking about tonight? Uh, for those of you that may have a copy of, of Monkey, the one that you saw on the screen just now, uh, there is a work from Furukawa in there that I translated, um, and it's a uh, Nise Garcia Marquez, or Counterfeiting Garcia Marquez, uh, which is a very interesting, playful, metafictional look at the, partly at the relationship between Japan and Latin American magical realism. And it's a really interesting, um, self-aware, almost a reflective um, essay and criticism built into multiple layers of, 
of a story that unpacks as a, as a narrator very similar to, to Furukawa and a fictional narrator similar to Garcia Marquez but made into a female version go back and forth in this kind of dance between trying to remember Garcia Marquez's literature in what he calls stains that remain in the mind sometimes decades after you read an original story. And he talks about how those stains that remain from fiction become part of us and also uh, self-fictionalize. They, they go farther and farther away from the truth of the fiction. And so when I hear Furukawa-san's comments you know, now about uh, fiction and nonfiction and reality and this dance between you know, truth and our world, um, I think that's a wonderful framework for this story. I encourage you all to read this story. We are not going to read this story <laughs> because uh, we are going to today give you a bit of a preview of the most recent work uh, that I believe, if we, if it goes well, I, I think we'll be going out in the next monkey. <laughs> um, and uh, so this is from a, a series of stories, uh, linked short stories that are uh, all written as kind of intertexts uh, with famous pieces of uh, literature. And the, the one that we're going to read today is in a dialogue, in a direct dialogue with uh, Mishima Yukio's uh, The Decay of the Angel, which is the final book in his very, very famous tetralogy. Um, I'm sure there, I'm sure most of you are familiar with Mishima, and if not, please, 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 you know, enjoy his uh, texts also. I enjoyed rereading uh, Mishima for uh, for this, but it also makes uh, reference to a lot of other pieces of uh, Japanese lore and um, folklore, uh, including a, a figure uh, sometimes known as um, Miminashi or a, a, a deaf um, character who is plagued by demons and has to write sort of spells on his body to ward them off. So you may pick up tones of that in here, but uh, it's an adaptation uh, of that where instead of the, the decay of the angel, this is the decay of, of aliens. And so the way he writes, you won't be able to pick this up in the reading today, but the way that um, the, the word aliens appears in the Japanese is tenning. So it looks kind of like angels or heavenly, uh, you know, people who descended from the heavens, uh, but it's glossed with the furigana of Eiriyang. And so uh, we've rendered it aliens here, but when you see it in print, the print will let you know that there's a special double entendre going there. Um, given the, the news recently about uh, the US government and uh, uh, various pilots having seen some very mysterious uh, objects uh, floating around in the sky, following pilots going uh, under the ocean and then disappearing, uh, I have this really dreadful feeling that uh, this is also prescient. Uh, Furukawa-san in, in some ways is also known as a predictor of, of disasters because some of his writing about disaster came out before the uh, Fukushima uh, tsunami and meltdown following the earthquake. And uh, it, it makes my skin crawl and I have goose flesh to think that the story we're about to read may also be prescient in a similar and haunting way. Who knows what kind of conversation we'll be having next year. That is the joy and that is the thrill of reading Furukawa Hideo. And I'm very, very honored to be able to bring that to you in English today. Thank you. Thank you, Joel. Yeah, since uh, Furukawa-san uh, talked about the uh, complex relationship between truth and untruth, and uh, uh, so his fiction could be termed as a very strange kind of metafiction, which might sound very, uh, sound like a very intellectual uh, project. But the great thing about his work is that there, it's always accompanied by this uh, very vivid sense of our physicality. Uh, and uh, with, with, that's also true with uh, Shibasaki-san's work too. Uh, she also always gives you a sense of a place with the layers of, of time. And uh, in those layers, you know, the past may be more real than, than the present. And uh, 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 how do you say? Uh, it's not just an a idea of, uh, of the past, but uh, uh, you get a very vivid sense of uh, what 
could have been there or even what uh, will be there in the future too. So uh, we, we, go, we are going now on to the uh, reading time. Uh, Shibasaki-san first. うちの晩ご飯。子供の頃からテレビドラマや家庭用品の CMでエプロン姿のお母さんが台所で料理を作りながらお帰りもしくは今晩何食べたいなんて子供たちやお父さんを迎えている場面を見るたびそんな家って本
絵に描いたような普通の家庭なんてないのかもしれない。誰でもわかるのは自分の家族のことだけだ。一人一人、どうにかこうにか必死に形を作っている家がいくつもいくつもあるだけなんだと思う。ありがとうございます。And she gives a bit of comments after the reading. Dinner at Mine by Tomoka Shibaza. As a child, whenever I saw television shows or commercials for household products that featured a mother in an apron standing there cooking in the kitchen as she greeted her husband and kids with, Welcome home and what would you like for dinner tonight? I would find myself wondering if homes like that really existed. Very possibly, they didn't just exist, but were in fact the norm. And yet for me, they always seemed far away, like something out of a fairy tale. In other words, the home in which I grew up did not look like that. In my home, my dad made the dinner. My mum was a hairdresser, and after my younger brother and I started at the daycare centre, she returned to work, eventually setting up her own salon when I was six. It was from that point on that my dad started cooking me dinner. These days, you occasionally hear talk of stay at home husbands, but my dad wasn't one of them. He worked at a company like any other dad. Every day, though, he would get home before seven to make his dinner. When we moved up to middle school, he packed our lunches too. The kind of food he rustled up for us was what you might call bachelor cuisine, yakisoba. Stir fried vegetables, things like that. Nestling along the side the rice in our bento boxes would be grilled chicken, edamame, frankfurters, basically all the things that people ate when they were out drinking. At the time, I remember resenting his cooking and would occasionally voice my complaints. But if my mother happened to be home in time to eat with us, my father wouldn't even let her make us tea after dinner. That was the kind of man he was. From time to time, He'd tell me that if I ever got married, I'd better not take it for granted that all men would do as much around the house as he did. As it happens, to this day, I'm still not married. But when I look around at my friends who are, it surprises me to note that there are still very few men who do as much as my dad did. When my mum had to work weekends, it was my dad who took us out to Osaka Castle Park or the Botanical Gardens. Now that I'm about the same age as my dad was back then, it strikes me as amazing that he made us dinner every day. And I also find myself wondering what on earth his life must have been like. Coming home on time, day in, day out, did his colleagues not go out drinking after work? And what about the days he was expected to work overtime? I remember how, from time to time, when both my mum and my dad were home late, my brother and I would go rifling through the fridge. Making plain rice sprinkled with salt or powdered sushi vinegar. However sad these culinary choices may sound, I think it was less a case of that being all there was and more that that was what we liked. But aside from set events like end of year parties and so on, I don't remember my dad ever coming home late after drinking. By now, I finally got to a point where I feel I'd like to ask my dad how he managed it and what his feelings were on the whole thing. But he passed away three years ago, and now it's too late. Not long ago, my mum spoke to me about her younger years, which for her is something of a rarity. Thus, I found out for the first time that back before she opened her own place, when my brother and I were still small, she had worked at a hairdressing salon that was in a prime location in Osaka and quite well known at the time. The owner took to my mother and was kind to her. But tended to land her with the unpopular shifts on the weekends and in the early mornings because she knew that my dad would step in to take care of her kids. Listening to my mum talk, I felt as if I were listening to a friend. A friend worrying about whether she'd be able to keep her job if she took time off to look after her kids. A friend wanting to try and save up the money to open her own place. Up until then, I'd always viewed my parents as a childhood, and this felt different. My brother has recently had a baby, 
but I still feel as though my hands are full enough dealing with my own stuff. As a child, seeing those aproned mothers on TV, welcoming their children home from school, I'd wonder if my family situation was weird in some way. But now I think that maybe there isn't such a thing as a perfectly normal family situation. All we ever really know is how things are in our own homes. There are only homes, homes, and more homes, with everyone inside them desperately trying to create some resemblance of a family. Thank you. Okay, it's our turn. Judy, you ready? Okay, let's roll. Tending alien, Tachua, take a go to the day. Are you the kids on the chicken? You know, Coca was a cook in his time. As the aliens built their empire. All the existing nations of the earth were refashioned as vassal states. So, the Arayu's of Kokuni, Sonomono no Katsu, Ijiseo, to Fukushita. These vassal states were all issued the edict to carry on with all activity as you were. Motion Jinri no Taihan was Tanga Tano Danga, Registan Senosha, Sidney Nijokuni, Okueta no de. その従順さのうちに、天人エイリアンたちは奇妙さをも見出した。Naturally, the majority of humans obeyed these orders because there were already upwards of two billion dead after the war of resistance. But the aliens also noted something odd within their obedience. 属国には属国の生態があり、それぞれの生態がさらに上位として帝国を。時にはいやいやながらも認めていたが、そのさらに上位を信じる者たちがいた。The vassal states all had their existing governments, while acknowledging, sometimes grudgingly, the superior government of the empire above them. But there were some who believed in an even higher power. この者たちはエイリアンたちを人類の一種とみなし。この上に神を置いたのである。These humans considered the aliens as, a, as another species alongside humans and placed above them all the existence of God. その神が一種類ではないのである。That God was not of only one variety. すなわち宗教なるものがあった。In other words, it was a form of religion. Religion had survived. Multiple religions with multiple gods. Many gods existed. Sometimes one god would denounce the others and declare that they were not truly gods. The aliens thought about it. では、最初から神が複数、許容された複数者である宗教はないのか Is there no religion that from the beginning has considered gods in the plural and accepted that as truth? 調査すると、容易に見つかった。A bit of research turned one up rather easily. 俗国間の教会を超えた世界宗教のうちでは、Among the religions that had made the leap beyond vassal state borders to become a world religion, there was Buddhism. しかもそこでは神が神と呼ばれなかった、仏と呼ばれた。However, Buddhists didn't refer to their god as God. He was known as the Buddha. 仏には種類があり、如来、菩薩などに分かれた。And there were many manifestations of the Buddha, Nyodai, Bodhisattva, and so on. So, the aliens were able to see the Buddha, 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 the Buddha
、エイリアンよりもさらに上位の存在を精神的には支えにしてもよい。しかし、都市を守護するのは仏たちであるとした。The aliens decided the higher power above them could be used as a psychological crutch as long as Buddhas remained the guardian deities of the cities. この段階でエイリアンたちは海、昔の空、と陸、と海、昔からの海が交わるところに関心を示し出した。At this stage, the aliens began to show interest in the point of intersection between the ocean, which had traditionally been called the sky, and the land, and the ocean, as it has always been called. And to that point of intersection, they summoned the musicians. At this point, there's one issue which requires more than a sentence to explain. The question of whether and how humanity could process and respond to a language such as that of the aliens. That not only has no written form, but whose very thought system lacked any grasp of visuality. They put the task to the humans who most excelled in audio sensibility. Of course, smell, touch, and taste were all important factors, but within the realm of language, it was hearing that was most crucial, and ears seemed almost like divine gifts. そして、各国、今では帝国の属国である地上の国家軍の初期の対応イコール対船及び対エイリアンにおいて交渉、接触にあたって有効だったのは言語学者とミュージシャンたちだった。And initially, the nations of the world, nations currently under imperial control as vassal states, found that the people most effective in dealing with the ships, in negotiating with the aliens, were the linguists and the musicians. So, the musician is the one who 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 is the o n To smooth out situations and appease the aliens. Just by singing or plucking a few strings. They interpreted the other's language as a performance in the musical sense, and they blended themselves in to form responses. すなわち、エイリアンと交流できる学士たちの世界規模での誕生である。That is to say, a global band was born, that of musicians capable of interacting with the aliens. こうした学士たちは、容易に船に乗り込めもした、呼ばれもした。And these musicians could easily board the ships. 人類として。As humanity. 人類の代表として、As representatives のみならず、天人エイリアンたちの発する人間として、各国とは属国間を自由に移動もした。Moreover, they could serve as the aliens' dispatches, moving freely between nations, or that is, vassal states. すなわち、旅をした。And they traveled. いずれ報告を船に戻すために。In order to bring all kinds of reports back to the ships. To bring back news to the aliens, the builders of this empire. The years passed. The aliens gradually grew weaker. It's only natural, but the aliens were simply a foreign species, not immortals. 
よって、老、病、死がある。So、they began to die of old age. 何段階かの遂行がある。Their decline came in stages. こうでもまたこれらの老いと死に至る衰えの段階から逃れられない。There was no escape. Eventually, even the Empress would reach the stage of aging and death. 皇帝が安眠できないという日々が訪れた。The time came when the Empress could no longer enjoy even a peaceful night's sleep. そして皇帝は安眠したかった。How the Empress longed for such sleep. だから、いかに大いなる帝国を今現在自分は治めているのかを知りたかった。And she wanted to know, how vast is this empire I am governing right now? それを天人エイリアンの皇帝は女性語でもって、私は知りたいのよ。ねえ、私に報告を乗ってこさせてちょうだいと言った、命じた。The alien empress commanded, summoning all the most feminine diction, personal pronouns, and sentence endings to embellish it. I do want to know. Someone please do fetch me a report on it. これまで以上にエリスグリの学士たちが求められ、派遣されることになった。They summoned the finest musicians ever seen and dispatched them. 皇帝の船はどこに停泊していたか。Where was the empress's ship anchored? 日本列島の本州と九州間の境をなす関門海峡の上だった。Floating in the zone above the Kanmon Straits just off Shimonoseki between Kyushu and Honshu, the main island of Japan. そこは海、昔からの海でありながら、同時に古戦場であり、また古戦場の海であるがゆえに、沿岸には弔いのための仏教のお寺が、また弔われないがゆえの、または弔われたがるがゆえのたたりの伝承があった。That area was the ocean in the original sense of the word, but it was also the site of a historic battle, a battle fought also on the ocean, with a Buddhist temple on the shore that had held funeral ceremonies and continued rituals for appeasements of the dead souls, and lore had it, some of whom would have wanted to be given funeral ceremonies. And were denied such ceremonies and so left behind their curse. The Empress proclaimed. The 耳は強調してだって聞かなければならないのだからそうね耳はね文字はなしでいいそれからその者たちの名前は全員「ほ」をつけてだから一人目は「ほういちよ」「サムンのミュージシャンズ」「ほうですね」「ほうですね」「ほうですね」「ほうですね」Into their bodies, tattooing their language on skin, and who traveled through every city. And since writing itself is meaningless, we treat these letters as passports issued by the empire, passports of the flesh. Emphasize the ears because they must hear. Yes, the ears. Oh, the ears. We have no need for the written word. And their names, all of them, must start with Ho, like Hoichi from the beautiful legend. Call the first among them. ほういち。こうして報告者たちは、ほういち、ほうに、ほうさん、またほうじゅう、ほうじゅうにと選定、算出されるのだった。In this way, the reporters, ほういち、ほうに、ほうさん、and down to ほうじゅう、and ほうじゅうに、and so on, came to be selected and sent out. 続々と。One after another. Thank you. That's all. Thank you. Jordan. Thank you so much, Hido and Jordan.、Um, I think you've seen the、uh, two opposites of what can be done in Japanese literature.、Um, very、uh, deceptively simple, but finally moving and haunting. And 
uh, electrifying from the very first and even loud, but very philosophical and thoughtful too. Okay, we take questions now. Yes. Um, oh, just a moment, let me pass you the microphone. <laughs> Um, my my question is is for you, and uh, I I could do it in Japanese probably, but I'm going to do it in English for everybody here. Um, I just yesterday watched a movie Doro no Kawa, which is very much about completely different households and how judgments are made against one family or another because of their differences. And it seems that your literature suggests to me that Japan is still um, making special the idea of the right kind of household. And I would have thought that at this stage of things that Japan would have moved forward into a larger embracing of different families, different thoughts, and different lifestyles. Uh, when I married my husband, I married him partially because he cooks, and he cooks very well. And I don't, I'm a terrible cook. I never worried for a minute, because I'm a loud, aggressive American, I never worried whether this would be a problem in Japan at all. But I found everywhere I went, people said, oh, you are so lucky. Meanwhile, I'm thinking, no, my husband is so lucky, because I let him cook. I let him express himself in the way he wants to. So I would just like you to, to talk a little bit about whether you think that there's some uh, changing in, in the ideas that this is the only way to live. Has there been progress or not? よく友人からも聞いたりするんですけど、料理するとかなんかすごく家のことをやってくれるっていうと、夫はやるとすごくみんなから褒められるのに、自分がやってもなんか普通だって言われるっていう話はあのよく聞きます。Yes, I often hear from my friends that if a husband cooks or does anything around the house, they are instantly praised, uh, even though if a woman does it, then, then nobody blinks an eye. で、あの、その泥の川の、あの、映画の舞台になっているところって、私は大阪出身なんですけど、あの、すごく、すごく近くなんですね。私が、あの、育ったところと。それで、あの、昔からそういうふうにいろんな家庭とか家族の形があって、
よくそういう,こうステレオタイプなことを語るこうあるべきっていうのを語るときにあのこれが日本の伝統だみたいな伝統的な家族だみたいなことを言われるんですけどそういう「泥の川」っていう作品があの小説や映画になってあることでそうじゃないっていうことを伝えるあのことができるのでやっぱりそこでこういうなんか文化的なものの力は大きいんじゃないかなと思いますしそれにあの今あの自分より若い人の話を聞いてるとやっぱりあの変わってきているところはすごくたくさんあると思います。And、um, when, people, when we talk about these stereotypes, people tend to say, well, it's the, Jap- it's the traditional way you know, of, of things in Japan. That's the Japanese tradition. But、uh, works like Doro no Kawa reveals that that's not. Always the case. And so I'm, I'm really happy that、uh, cultural works,、uh, novels,、um, or, or films、um, expose reality uh, and um, is able to give voice to, to the reality of things. Yes,、uh, there are two newer、uh, films about families, one from Japan, one from Korea.、Uh, the Japan one, Shoplifters, were.、Uh, Complete strangers make up a family, and the co- Korean family parasites.、Uh, real family pretend to be complete strangers. So, in Korea's films, in the Japanese one,、uh, the assumption is that the families are already broken and there, there must be new ways to create them. So,、uh, it really depends on、uh, which aspect of,、uh, of, uh, of Japan you look at. And in, in Korea's case, he is. Uh, trying to look、uh, on the other side of stereo- I mean,、uh, something other than stereotypes, I think. Oh, really? I didn't know that.、Oh. Okay. So that's probably because it didn't conform to the idea of a stereotyped、uh, Japanese family.、Yeah. Thanks very much. Yeah, Thank you.、Yeah. Any other question? Thank you.、Um, I have a few questions, but I'll just ask them both. One is about、uh, the essay in Monkey Counterfeit- Counterfeiting Garcia Marquez. And I was just really curious if it was a travel to a place in Latin America that inspired or informed some of it. Did you? Uh, yeah. uh, actually, I have been to travel there uh, uh, for about one month,、uh, searching for real Marcus houses.、Uh, he, he, he lived in, and he, I, I have an urge to find what spaces like houses make some people write some true things. And、uh, when I read Garcia Marquez's、uh, Solitude of 100 Years,、uh, I felt real great truth in his. Uh, big uh, mega novel, and why he could do that?、Uh, what had had him to consider plots and find something complicated structures?、Uh, if I found his houses he had lived in, I could feel. The clues, hints, how I would be able to write novels like a bit, a bit like Solitude of One Year s or Two Years or <laughs> blah, blah, blah. <laughs> so that was a real big experience for me. Uh, stayed in Mexico City. So, 
uh, after about six years have had passed, uh, I wrote the original Japanese version of uh, Counterfeiting Girls in Marcus. And um, at that time, I could smell scents in Mexico City and feel atmospheres around Mexico City. And I thought, oh, Garcia Marquez also smelled this odors and scents and felt and breathed these atmospheres and airs. Uh, it's a kind of uh, it's kind of a word of God specified in literature. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I also just the reading and performance tonight was totally amazing. I just that question had stayed with me from reading uh, before, like that kind of stain of how did this come? Um, the reason why I wanted to do this event initially was because of conversations that I've had with Shivata-san over the years, and I just always want everyone to meet him <laughs> um, because of his understanding for me of Japanese and American culture. And I'm curious, uh, Shibata-san, you're, you're, the monkey community is very much, I, I see as binational. I know there's more than just American and Japanese, but from my point of view, I've that's what I've, because I've met you in New York, and I just wonder how you all have kept your fire burning through this time that you haven't been able to see each other, just the kind of conversations that you've been having internationally in terms of the larger community of Japanese and American um, writers. コロナ禍にあって、あの、すごく大変な時期にどうやってその日本のコミュニティ、アメリカのコミュニティをつなぐ、そのなんか炎、炎というか、あのそのファイヤー、キープドファイヤーバーニング、どうやってそのつながりを
ふうにはあの思わなかったのでそれはあの作家になるのにすごくいい影響だったと思います。In Japan, there's, there is a big pressure to conform. And so I think it was important that I never had to feel that way.、Um, of course, I did encounter、uh, hardships、um, growing up that I didn't fit in, but that didn't make me feel that I had to change myself. And so I think that did influence me as a writer quite a bit.、Uh, by the way,、uh, Hideo mentioned Garcia Marquez's 100 Years of Solitude,、uh, but、uh, Shibasaki-san's latest book is amazing, interrelated collection of stories, and it's entitled 100 Years and a Day. So she goes one day better than Garcia Marquez. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Please. please.、Yeah, we've got time for one last question. Then、yes. we need to switch over to the book sale and signing. Please, Karen. Thank you. Sorry, I have a multi part question, too. Sorry, Drew.、Um, for Shibata-san. So the title of today's Uh, lecture is a glimpse of Japan's new golden age of fiction through its avant garde literati. And I was wondering if you can tell us what you believe were the circumstances that have given rise to this new golden age of fiction. And then perhaps maybe from Jordan, how can we get, we get more of it translated into English? And then will you have more monkey editions coming out? Sorry, uh, I think music is very important. Some of the、uh, some of our best writers we have today, like Miyako Kawakami or Machida Ko, you know, they are wonderful musicians. And these two authors、uh, are very, very fond of music, even though they, don't, they are not musicians themselves. So、uh, the pro, I mean, the newer writers' prose is much more, you know, musical in the best、uh, sense of the word. And the uh, uh, The other、uh, factor is that、uh, probably it's a good thing that uh, uh, people, less people, read books these days. You know, before, you know, when, when I was young, you know, books were something you had to read you know, to, to, to be cultured, to look cultured. But these days,、uh, uh, it's only people who really care about books that read books. So、uh, even though the、uh, readership is, isn't huge, there is uh, a wonderful, uh, uh, interested, uh, eager uh, group of readers who take、uh, fiction seriously, and the uh, uh, writers respond to them. I'll pick up right where he left off. Uh, a good, interested, committed group of readers. If you can participate in that, you are, you are at the cutting edge of literature and you are supporting the heart of literary production in translation and otherwise. And I think Monkey is a great example of that. I also、um, translate and edit Tokyo Poetry Journal,、um, which、uh, Kit has been in, and maybe some of you behind your masks, I can't tell who anyone is,、um, <laughs> have contributed to. But Furukawa san's works will also be appearing in Tokyo Poetry Journal next time around with his first,、uh, I think, first prose poetry <laughs>、uh, written about some of his travel experiences in、uh, Middle East, North Africa, you know, kind of.、Um, Uh, for a special volume that we're doing. So, what I would say is there's a lot going on, a lot of great translations out there, supported by people like Shibata Sensei、um, and、um, Hitomi Yoshi, also, who's been a great supporter of that. So, I would say for everyone,、uh, create time. And you know, volunteer at, you know, to, to in any of these events or in the production of these. Many of you guys have probably excellent you know, literature and、uh, literary backgrounds, translation experience, things like that, and can contribute in a lot of ways.、Uh, and then I would say just make, yeah, make the time to enjoy it. You know, the one great thing about Monkey is that there's a lot of poetry, a lot of short stories, a lot of essays, a lot of things that you don't have to commit. You know, 60 hours to reading right away. You can get a taste and decide if you really like it, and then you can pursue it and find more by that author. And I think、um, Shibata san does a great job, along with Ted Goosen and Med- Meg Taylor、uh, and Roland Keltz, of kind of curating、uh, r- writers that you can really trust to deliver you great diversity of experiences. Thanks for the great question, and thanks everybody for coming out. Thank you very much, everyone, and thank you to our panelists. Thank you.